it kind of resonates with me now is that's the path I should be on. Whereas before I stayed in my comfort zone, in my bubble. Yeah. And, um, and I, I feel like it was good, you know, you just stumble along day by day, but there wasn't any goals. There wasn't any real plans. So I want to switch that. And I want to speak things into action now. I want to come down here and I want to experience it, but I also want to help. And I want to, the small amount of knowledge that I have in, you know, the IT, technical IT security, cloud space, networking, whatever it is, I feel like I could enable um, the students that you guys down, have down here at Hope House, which is phenomenal. Live here once again from Bitcoin Beach. Today we have Matthew joining us and uh, we're changing it up a little bit. Uh, usually we have people, you know, escaping the cold of Canada that are coming down here and looking to start life here in El Salvador. But Matthew, you, you live in Hawaii. You're already in paradise, um, but yet you have it uh, on the, the goal to, to move here and make life here. So Explain to us how, how you could be leaving Hawaii and, and why you think it's better here. Yeah, so I was born in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I lived there for you know, 33 years in Pennsylvania. Went to university in Philadelphia, stayed in Philadelphia for 15 years. Uh, I was just kind of upset at work one day. Googled jobs in Hawaii, found one. Moved out there, did four years. Had, had you ever been to Hawaii or you no, just randomly? Never. Yeah, just we just <laughs> never went and visited, just packed two suitcases and I went out. Um, I went, um, they have a, it's a rabies free island. So we have two pets. My wife, um, she stayed back uh, for 90 days to do the quarantine. So I was there for 90 days, um, just found out where to live, things like that. I worked for um, one of the largest employers in Hawaii. It's a big health insurance company. I do like IT um, infrastructure network security work. I uh, loved it there. We then moved from Oahu to Big Island, Kona Coast, and it was even better. Um, I never thought I would be uh, looking to move anywhere else. It's a little more rural there, right? Like a little people are more spread out. Yeah, it's, it's a huge island. It has, I think, six of the seven climate zones of the world that you can drive to. So I do work um, also uh, for uh, WM Keck Observatory. So one of the two telescopes on top of Mount Akea. So in one day I can be in the beach in the morning, body surfing, and then drive up to work and there's snow on the mountain. And it's, it's kind of trippy being in Hawaii and seeing that sort of different climates and driving around much more rural um spread out a lot more land not as crowded as oahu um not as good restaurants as oahu for <laughs> sure um and then we found um during covid we started doing some research understanding a little bit more about money um found out we were losing money by traditionally saving our money in you know traditional investment vehicles 401ks things like that uh that led us to bitcoin um some of my friends uh, so before that you you had really no interest in Bitcoin. You weren't really focused on your investments or, no, or thinking I, I about No, I was just that. a typical consumer. You know, I would go out and make money and spend it. And, you know, we saved in the 401ks and we saved a little bit of savings for if something would happen. Um, but I didn't realize much. I didn't have a strategy or I was just kind of going day by day. And once I started educating myself and did some of the work and talked to some other people, um, it just led me to Bitcoin. And then that led me to looking into other places, right? That were more favorable. Uh, Hawaii is very, very restrictive um, with Bitcoin, right? We have maybe five or six different companies that we can use in Hawaii. Um, and then they've seen some of those have kind of gotten kicked out as well. Um, and for me to see a place like El Salvador um, really incentivizing and getting behind the technology and identifying as a way to pull themselves up and change uh, their situation, it was kind of the opposite of what I'm experiencing in Hawaii with it, right? Where they um, don't give it the same rights. And when I yeah, it came down here. My wife and I loved it. We came for adopting Bitcoin last year, um, stayed in San Salvador, got to see the city a little bit, came down to Zante and met a lot of like-minded people that were doing the same thing from all over the place, right? Coming, like you said, from Canada, from cold countries. I was the only one that I met from Hawaii that was looking to come down here, but it just 
resonated with me being here, right? There's lots of emotional moments, talking with people about their stories, meeting the families down here, seeing how they kind of support each other and, you know, stand by their side, trying to pay a lightning invoice and somebody has a cracked phone, doesn't work and they have another family member, they have another phone, let's try a third phone. And it's just like a very um, open sharing. It was a different vibe for me that uh, my wife and I fell in love with. Yeah, that's what I, I tell people. It's kind of almost feels like you're at a nonstop uh, Bitcoin conference because you have all these like minded Bitcoiners here and just living life together. And so you have people coming in and out just to visit, but then mm -hmm. increasingly people choosing to, you know, put down roots here. Yeah. Uh, and I think you said this was the first time you'd been out of the US yeah. or maybe North America. You'd been just to Canada before. I, I, never, I never traveled. I was you know, just kind of stuck in my ways and similar. A lot of my family, they all still live in the same city, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, I went to Canada once, didn't like it. And my first real trip was when I moved to Hawaii. I flew to Hawaii, stayed there. Um, didn't know how long that would last, right? But we've been there eight years. It's been great. And then, yeah, my buddy, um, got married in costa rica last year so we went to their wedding and then hopped up for the conference it just ended up lining up <clears throat> really well for us and then it's it blew my mind um every person that i talked to in the states whether it's family friends uh business associates they all warned me about el salvador right but none of them had ever been to el salvador none of them had ever done any research on it they just look at the mainstream media and whatever that narrative is, that's the thing that they remember, that little tidbit, right? Oh, gangs in El Salvador, kidnappings, violence, drug, blah, blah, blah. And when I got down here, I didn't see any of that, right? It was kind of very organized. Uh, I tell the story all the time. When we flew to Costa Rica, to El Salvador, it was the most organized plane ride I had ever been on in my life. Like anybody else that's American watching this, you know, the you hear the bell, take off the seatbelts, everybody stands up and grabbing and pulling stuff out and dropping it on people's heads from the overhead bins. And there was none of that. It was like, so, really, it was, it was unbelievable. You must, you must have had a bunch <laughs> yeah. of Swiss people on that flight or something. Yeah, yeah but it, it blew my mind. So like literally from the moment I stepped off the plane, it was the exact opposite of like what I expected. Okay. And then it just kept building and building and building from there. So it's just a yeah, special place, special people. How, how did it compare to Costa Rica? Did, how did that be the first place you went? Yeah, so I actually thought the same thing. We went to Costa Rica. We stayed in Guanacaste at a resort for the wedding. And then we took a drive, went to San Jose, did El Paz uh, Waterfall Park and Animal Sanctuary. And they told us, um, well, you could take a small plane to get there or you could drive. It'll take four hours. Um, so like eight or nine hours later, <laughs> we arrived in San Jose. Oh, this windy, bumpy, terrible road. And I kind of expected the same when I got to El Salvador. And then I got here and it was like the roads are great. Our driver was, he could be a NASCAR driver. Uh, and, and he was <laughs> very, very efficient getting us to the hotel and navigating all the traffic right in San Salvador. And everybody was super friendly. And it's almost, um, living in Hawaii, there's a bit of a feeling out period that I've experienced where you come out there and I've talked to some of my uh, Hawaiian and you know Samoan friends and they explained it to me that they've experienced a lot of, you know, they make these friendships and people and they become good friends and you hang out with them and they know your family. And then one day they just pick up and leave and they move back, you know, back home to somewhere, you know, in the States. And so there's this kind of feeling out period. And then once you get over that, it's great. You kind of get welcomed in and you know, get invited to things. When I came down here, I kind of expected the same thing, but it was much more friendly and, you know, welcoming and especially not being able to communicate down here. I do not speak Spanish. I'm on day 30 of Duolingo. Um, <laughs> I was talking to Paco the other day about me wanting to come down here and teach technology stuff. And I tried communicating in Spanish. It was very quick and obvious that, that it was not my strong suit. So I need to focus on that. But that's also something that draws me now is when I get those anxious feelings or butterflies in my stomach, it, it kind of resonates with me now is that's the path I should be on. Whereas before I stayed in my comfort zone, in my bubble. Yeah. And, um, and I, I feel like it was good, you know, you just stumble along day by day, but there wasn't any goals. There wasn't any real plans. So I want to switch that and I want to speak things into action now. I want to come down here and I want to experience it, but I also want to help and I want to 
the small amount of knowledge that I have in you know the IT technical, IT security, cloud space, networking, whatever it is, I feel like I could enable um, the students that you guys down, have down here at Hope House, which is phenomenal. I got to do a, a tour the other day and see the English classes that you guys are teaching for, you know, um, adults right that are working, uh, whether it's hotel, restaurant, jobs, you know, and they can enable them to get promotions, right, or make more money by being able to communicate with the tourists that are coming down here and then seeing the kids that all have laptops right and they're sitting there and they're talking to me like they've just been learning english they're talking to me in english right and they know way more than i do in spanish and it's just like unbelievable to see that right so i think it will be good for me to be able to come down here um, volunteer my time to help teach right and maybe some of these kids and adults now can work some of these uh jobs right that i do it consulting independent it consulting they could work that, but also I think as infrastructure and companies get built out down here, there's going to be a need for that skill set here. So enable them, give them the knowledge, give them the wherewithal and give them the real world experience to be able to take on these jobs, right? Make higher income, right? Take some of that money from the States, bring it down here, yeah. give it to your family, you know, uplift your family, plan for generational wealth. I think they're already ahead of that with Bitcoin, right? Than anywhere else around the world, right? Just by adopting a Bitcoin standard. Well, I think that's one of, there's such potential here for that because of the adoption of Bitcoin, because now of the influx of people from around the world, from investors around the world, from people looking to move here from around the world, they're going to bring those job opportunities with them. And it, you know, 20 years ago, if you were in El Salvador and wanted a higher paying job, you had to pick up and move to the US or Europe. Mm. Now, so many opportunities are remote that yeah. There's no issue with them staying mm -hmm. here in the community, yeah. not having to sever their ties, but to start mm -hmm. increasing their their monthly salaries, start building their own businesses and kind of move their way mm -hmm. up the food chain. Yeah. So I'm super excited about your idea to come down because for a lot of them, they're just like, OK, how do I start? They don't have anybody in their life that they know that's working remotely. They don't even know. They, they kind of sense that it's out there, but they don't know if it's possible for mm -hmm. them or what even the first steps are. So I always encourage people come down, help people start developing the skills that they need for those entry level remote mm -hmm. jobs that are still going to pay two to three times what they could make here. But then allow them to start being mentors for the people that are younger than them. And we can kind of yeah. really transform the the opportunities for the next generation here. Yeah, and uh, I teach um, in, in between working uh, Keck Observatory, uh, independent IT consulting. I teach classes two nights a week at uh, Hawaii Community College. Um, and I taught before that in person at Kapiolani Community College over on Oahu. And it's all just cloud services, right? Teaching people how to, the first class was topics in cloud foundations, Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, Azure, Microsoft Cloud, and how to spin up workloads and make that stuff work, do the basic blocking and tackling to set up a network security. And from there, I went and started teaching certifications. So now some of these uh, students that may be working a lower level job, right, maybe just a help desk job or something or call center, they can take a certification, right? And then when they go apply, oh, now you have a, a certificate. And it's almost equated to like having a trade, right? If you're an electrician, you get certified and you can go around the world, right? And you can take yeah. that trade with you and you can work. But the good thing about doing it in technology is remote, right? You don't have to travel there, right? You can stay here, have your home base, support your family. You don't have to worry about remittances. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff, right? There is some like red tape with some of the... Um, you know, data like so working in healthcare, right? HIPAA. Um, when we had anything that was outsourced, you have to put some certain controls in place, right? Kind of clean rooms, make sure that people, the data isn't leaving the states and things like that. But I'm familiar enough and I'm going through that process that I think I can come down here and set up that equivalent, right? And be able to enable whether it's kids that want to learn from a young age or adults that want to change, right? And do something different. Here's a way, here's a path. Here's the one that I did. It may not be the right path, but yeah. it enabled me right through these different sort of certifications. Um, and so how, how long would it take somebody that, you know, say was, you know, already computer literate, mm -hmm. not, yeah. not talking about taking somebody from the field, but somebody that, that is already familiar with, with computers maybe has, you know, at least a high school education, possibly a university education. Mm -hmm. How long will it take them to get some of these practical certificates that they can actually now go out and start yeah. taking on jobs? So I think if they're coming in and they have basic computer skills, they understand, you know, how to get their way around. You can kind of start with the, like CompTIA does really good. Um, 
um, you know, A plus certification, network certification, security certifications. Um, and it's, it's funny because my wife is um, in, in the middle of a career change as well. And she's looking into these certifications tracks if she wants to do that or maybe become a programmer. And I said the same thing to her. It's like, hey, start here. Just do this one course, right? And it's free. Like these courses, some of them you don't have to pay for. There's like so much tools that are available out there right now. The information is out there. It's good to have somebody like myself that can sit there and explain it. But um, like the courses I teach now are six weeks long, right? And they're two nights a week for two and a half to three hours, right? So at the end of six weeks, you're prepared to go take an exam and come out with your certificate, right? And then, so let's say you want to do three of those courses, you know, you're looking at you know, maybe what, two, three, four months, five months of time. And then from there, you have a good understanding of, oh, here's the components in this ecosystem. Which one interests you, right? Or maybe yeah. you do it a different way. Which one can I make the most money off of, right? And then you decide, oh, I'm going to go take these specialized certifications, maybe to be a developer or IT security or computer networking or specific cloud, right? That maybe is getting adopted more than the others. And you can find a niche where there's work and it's there's lots of jobs that are available out there for it now. Right? And I think it's people that are motivated, willing to learn, willing to step out of their comfort zone, willing to make mistakes too, right? That's something that I struggled with for a long time was the fear of failure and making mistakes. But I've learned some of the best lessons in my life from making mistakes. I was in college and I took a consulting gig with a patent lawyer and um, was working at a small office and I was trying to free up some disk space and I, I deleted half of their patent files. <laughs> Um, and I didn't, right. And I realized halfway through and I stopped it and we tried, you could do forensics to try to recover yeah. the data and everything, but it was kind of expensive and it was just a moment of shame for me. Right. And I was like, wow, this is terrible. Like I really, really fucked this up and, um, worked with them, tried to make it right as best I could. Did a lot of manual work to help recover data entry, put this stuff back. But from that mistake, like I've learned so much more than if I would have just went through and, you know, not made that mistake. And I think just those type of things getting prepared to fail and not thinking of it as something bad, right? Taking it as a learning experience, turning it into something new. Um, but yeah, there's lots of opportunity for this out there. Um, I'm, I'm curious, is this something that they would have to have some level of, of English to participate in or, or would, could you pair them up? Like there's a team and one person on the team yeah, speaks English good. and the others can do the work or, yeah, so or how the, are you looking at that? The good things with a lot of it is, you know, there's all the languages are kind of built in, right? So put your computer in English, put your computer in Spanish. Um, for like stuff like networking, I, I do a lot of wireless networking, routers, switches, firewalls, things like that. That has a command line, right? And it's mostly English. So there's a set of commands that you need to learn, um, but it's, it's limited, right? It's small and it's just kind of through repetition, right? So I don't think that there's a big barrier to being able to do the actual work. I think where that comes in is like, say that person wants to take it to the next level instead of being a technician. Now you want to go communicate with people and talk about your projects yeah. and things like that. That's kind of the next evolution of it. But yeah, there's, there's a, in my mind, such a low barrier of entry because of the language, you know, it's just more when you progress, right? Just like with the people you guys are teaching for the hotels and service jobs down here, right? As you progress and you can communicate more effectively, you know, you get looked at in a different light, different opportunities open to yourself, right? And then other people, start communicating, oh, he did this for me. Yeah, help me out with this thing. Maybe they can help you, right? And it just kind of grows organically from there. So so just as a hypothetical, taking somebody that, you know, already knows their way around the computer, mm -hmm. they spend six months getting these these certificates. What then is their next step? Is this is this going to be gig work? Can they get employed full time? Like what would be the... I think it's... Well, the, the way I've done it successfully with some of the students that I was able to bring on board um, in my previous role, we started them as a contractor, you know, and I was like, hey, here's a six month gig. We're going to have you and we're going to put you with somebody as a mentor, right, to teach you the ways because each business operates a little bit differently, yeah. right? They have their own standard operating procedures to learn. Um, and then after that, it, it's kind of a beneficial two-way street where you get to evaluate the worker they get to evaluate the environment and make sure it's a good fit right and i think that's really important too of not taking a job that's not a good fit for yeah. you right because you're just going to burn yourself out burn the candle at both ends type of thing so yeah there's um six months 
go out, you can do a couple of certificates. And it also gives you, because it's not a high cost of doing these courses, if you identify that you don't like it, you can, there's yeah. lots of other stuff to go out there and do, right? And it just gives you that um, broader experience, broader perspective. And what what would somebody like that be able to, to earn? I, I know nothing about yeah. that industry or that type yeah. of work, so. I would say um, of the, like the real world cases I can think of, people that I was able to bring on, whether it was a desktop support team, right, that works on a company's laptops, right, and computers, IT security team, right, that works on uh, the security tools that run on the computers or a, a network team. I would say that the low end, you normally come in as like a call center, right, you take tickets, and there's a knowledge base of how you resolve these tickets, and you help and you, you know, and communicate and resolve those things. Those jobs um, are probably around 60k us dollars um per year um and then as you kind of progress and maybe you want to go join the network team and work on routers switches wireless right and you're probably looking in the 70k range security is like another skill kind of on yeah. top of that you're 80. And, and do you think that that's something realistically that that, that somebody here could yeah. move their way up that food chain um oh yeah there's no they don't really care where they're located or yeah. what nationality they are or yeah what? i think there is and i think also um and that's the one of the um my my job's work i need to do is because of the work that i've done and the connections i've made and these companies i'm doing business with is sell them on this idea as well hey i'm coming down here there's motivated people they're already learning they're um, looking you know, to contribute and can I build those partnerships and build that bridge, right? So it's an on-ramp for these type of jobs, right? Because it is hard. Like if you're just going to send resumes out, say, oh yeah, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in Zante. I, you know, just um, completed my English course. I just completed my certificate. It's going to be hard for you yeah. to get a job, right? But I think that's where I can come in and I can try to build that bridge to some of the companies that I already work with, some of the partnerships that I already have. Say, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'd like to try this experiment and I'd like you to come on and be in, involved in it as well. And so far in those conversations, they've been about 50, 50, some okay. people, you know, say, yeah, whatever. Like we, eh, it's not, that's not the way we do things. Yeah. We've done this for blah, blah, blah. But the other people are very interested in it. Right. And it's not from a, um, I'm not coming it at it from an outsourcing perspective. Like that's something a lot of these companies are doing outsourcing things to the Philippines, outsourcing things to India, just for lower labor costs. Yeah. Right. And I don't want to position that further down here, right? This is, should be, um, same thing with Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is Bitcoin is Bitcoin. Everything should be priced the same and the service you're selling should be denominated the same. I'd like to kind of champion that going forward and, and use this as a springboard for it down here. Well, I think they would find that, that their employee turnover would be much lower mm. because a lot of times those are entry level things and people are just looking to be in that till mm -hmm. they can get their next best opportunity. Yeah. Where I think what they would find here is because the the cost of living is so much lower and mm -hmm. these other things and the other opportunities around mm -hmm. there, there's not as much competition. So they would have very loyal employees that are going to like stay with them for decades rather than the, you know, because yeah. it's expensive to have that churn. It's yeah. expensive to do everything, to onboard an employee mm -hmm. and then two months later have them yeah. go somewhere else because they offered them 10,000 more a year. Yeah. So if they can kind of build that loyal workforce, I think it'd be a competitive advantage. Yeah, and we see that a lot in Hawaii, right? Where people come out, it's an experiment. They wanna come and live here, they're gonna sign up for this job. I mean, the turnover, it's just a revolving door, right? And then it's hard on the, the HR people, the recruiters to go out and find, it's expensive to go through this process, background checks, all the different things. So I totally agree with you. Build an environment that's gonna enable people and give them a career path and give them a blueprint to follow and be committed there. And then kind of, as we've talked before the show, um, I'm interested in setting up a business model. Um, so I found an independent consulting in Hawaii that's called uh, Uila. Mm -hmm. Uila is the Hawaiian word for lightning. I, th I think we have your uh, logo here somewhere, you know, the cool animation of it, of Andy, throw it up there. Yeah, so it um, was, I've just very, um, oh yeah, there's my logo. So anybody that needs logo work done, there's lots of cool uh, people on Fiverr and Upwork that do this type of animations. I would have taken days or weeks and it would have looked terrible. I, <laughs> this guy turned this around in 10 minutes, you know, for like a hundred bucks and it was awesome. And I didn't have a use for it until today. So thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I founded this company in Hawaii. Um, 
and I also came down this week uh, to Zante. I, I met a, a awesome lawyer, uh, Daniel Leva, at uh, the Adopting Bitcoin conference last year. He did a workshop on bring your business to El Salvador. I mean, as soon as I saw it, that was the one I circled a bunch of times and was like, make sure I go to this one, right? Don't be hanging out at the bar too late. Don't miss this conference. And I stayed in contact with him and um, it's also interesting perspective, like what I read online of how long the process is going to take to come to El Salvador and set up your business. It could be six months. So that's actually why I came in May, because we're planning. We set a deadline to be down here by October. So I was like, that's roughly six like months. You guys are moving here. This, oh, is, this is home. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we love to hear it's just it. Yeah, it just feels like the right path, you know, and um, kind of like I said before, ever since we committed to that. It's like the exit lights in the airplane or out of the movie theater have come on. It's like illuminated the path forward. And instead of me reaching for things and getting caught off, the things that I've needed to be able to move down here have now just fallen into place. And it's a weird, um, I met to I impromptu meet up the other day and the guys kept calling it serendipity. I had to look up what that word meant, but it was a very <laughs> good description. So not only is my Spanish bad, also my English. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't think I knew what that meant. I think there was a movie or something uh, with that title yeah. in it. So uh, that's all I need uh, yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I got sidetracked with that, but I came down, set up my business structure. It was done in a day, right? I went to um, San, San Salvador, uh -huh. uh, Monte Building, uh, met with Daniel in the morning. Um, I signed a power of attorney so that you're going to get me my tax ID, uh, set up bank accounts for me, set up my deed of incorporation. Were you able to get your bank account pretty quickly? Yeah, it was yeah, okay. it was very nice with Cause, those guys. Because the banks, from my experience here, are horrible to work with. So that's mm -hmm. very encouraging to hear that you were able to get that yeah. done really quickly. And I've talked to some of the other um, Bitcoiners that I met down here, people that moved down here. And I think I paid a premium for the service, um, but also for with me being down here for a short amount of time, I didn't want to spend a lot of time driving from bank yeah. to bank and waiting. I'd rather your, come Your time is valuable too. Yeah. So it's uh, the cheapest isn't always the best way yeah. to do it. Yeah, but it was good. I would recommend it. And then just through meeting other people, People down here, I've gotten connected right with uh, Good Life El Salvador. Did a tour, just checking out different areas. They showed me different places. I talked with Gladys. Um, you know, was, so so where? What are your thoughts on the different places that you could live? Like, uh, what is? Where have you visited? And you know, what's yeah. what's top on your priority list as oh, far man. as I think where it, you want to be? I think the thing that was good for me about the tour is it informed me that I don't know enough yet to make that decision, right? Every place they showed me was awesome for different reasons, right? There was San Blas, which was beautiful. There was, a, you know, I had a beachfront lot there that needed some work, um, which was awesome right on the beach. I love to body surf. That's like my favorite hobby. Not very good at it, but it still clears my mind and gets yeah. me exercise and everything. Um, looked in the hills above San Blas, and there was a beautiful house there as well. The family was selling. Um, we went down and, you know, toured a Tommy looked at some houses there. And I also like, um, from that experience, it kind of showed me that it wasn't so much for me an investment opportunity coming down here. They showed me some houses. Oh, this guy in LA owns his house set up for three Airbnbs. It's a great pool, outdoor kitchen, things like that. It's like, that's not my reason for coming down here, right? It's not for me to just come and make money off of this, right? And then bail and flip a house or something, right? Not that there's anything wrong with that, even though I think there is something wrong with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that it was eye opening for me. But yeah, long answer for I don't know yet. Yeah. I, I want to come down. I think I'm going to land somewhere. Same as in Hawaii. I did Airbnb for a month and kind of moved around and checked out areas. And once we found one, that was great. And then my wife came out afterwards with our dogs and everything. So we may employ that similar strategy of let's try a couple of different places out, see what we like and see what we can find and then figure it out from there once we get here, though. But it sounds like you're more looking to the beach rather than like the capital city or yes. oh yeah okay yeah i had enough of the city philadelphia was great um oahu honolulu was great you know yeah. lots of events lots of concerts lots of food lots of people but i think i'm more of a country boy i like the beach and um yeah so definitely near the beach close by to the beach outside of the city yeah yeah the Obviously, I live here in El Zante. The, the beach is my favorite. Mm -hmm. More recently, I'm, I'm starting to like kind of some more of the mountain areas that are, you know, within a 45 minute drive of the beach just because you have the cooler yeah. temperature, but you're still not in the city. So there, there's a lot of variety in the climate, too. Yeah, I rented a car yesterday and just went driving around just to see and explore on my own. And I drove up. Um, Took a left out of Zante, hung the first right, and just drove up to the top of the mountain. Oh, up to Chiltipan. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. down. 
Santa Ana. I was trying to find some Mayan ruins and uh, Google Maps didn't do the best job of yeah. getting me there. They dropped me on the wrong side of a river. <laughs> Somebody came out from the restaurant and explained to me, it was okay. So I didn't get to see the Mayan ruins yet. I'll put that on my list, <laughs> try again. But you got to see a lot of the country. Right? It so, was nice and it was yeah. much cooler. It was, you know, that, that's something I've, I've been sweating since I got off the plane. Um, it's hot down here. Yeah. Um, everybody looks at me like, oh, you live in Hawaii for all these years. Hawaii doesn't get above 24 degrees, 85 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And coming down here and it's, you know, 30, 95 degrees and humid as well. Yeah. It's, so I, that could be uh, something that would drive us to choose one way or the other. But just as long as it's not in the city and we can get to the beach in a relatively short amount of time. Yeah. And this is the the hottest time of the year right now. So it's, uh, hmm. you gotta keep keep that in mind. But yeah, it's, I've been here for, you know, living in, in El Zante for the last 10 years and I'm starting to get to the point where I'm thinking, eh, maybe a little higher elevation and come visit the beach. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't know, I, I might miss it too much if I left, so we'll see. Yeah, that was on coming over here to do this uh, podcast with you. I was going to walk and um, I packed a bag with a second set of clothes and a towel and stuff. And then luckily somebody at the hotel hooked me up with a ride over here. So I didn't have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You work up a sweat this yeah. time of year. To, and I think a lot of it's just the humidity even more than the, the heat. Yeah. So this, we're at the beginning of the rainy season. So it's it's not raining enough to like cool things mm -hmm. down, but just enough to make it really steamy. Yeah, and it's not as bad when the breeze is going, but I kind of yeah. notice when the tides change, it just whew, sinks in and you know, not much wind going on. And that's when it um, kicks in for me big time. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what just a little breeze, the mm -hmm. difference that it makes. Yeah. So, And is your wife totally on the same page with, with you yeah. on this? Or is this like, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so are you guys I'm, negotiating coming down no, here? Or? It was it was like both of us came to the same realization when we were here in November. We didn't want to leave. And um, I was actually, I'm supposed to be at the airport right now. Um, <laughs> and then I got a text from you yesterday. I was telling my wife, um, I was like, I don't I don't want to leave. You know, I, I want to stay. And then you text me, it's like, perfect. This is awesome. I was in Tunco last night at another Bitcoin meetup. I was doing my phone. I was like, oh, this is great. So I, I sent it to her. And I, just, I didn't want to like, I so said, what should I do? And she just sent back all caps, send it can send it right <laughs> yeah Timbera messaged me yesterday he's like oh, you gotta interview this guy from hawaii that, that's planning on moving here i was like all right yeah but it's it's great you know and i think finding those local um, resources that are motivated they want to be an owner operator they want to own a business they want to pass that business down to their family i would love to set up that structure out here right start something help them along the way but maybe after 10 years just give it away you know not give it away but they're doing the work yeah. right yeah, yeah so my ownership just falls time after time you know 10 percent every year until it's a fully owned company by somebody so, else so find somebody that's motivated mm -hmm. and can benefit from your experience and connections and yeah. start a business with them. But over mm -hmm. time, let them yep. assume I love that model because yeah. it, it allows them to and for a lot of them, they don't have those connections or the mm -hmm. resources to start from scratch, but they have the drive. Mm -hmm. And so if you can kind of pair that and make it in a way that long term that becomes their business. I yeah. love that model. And I'm sure you recognize this as well as you go travel different places. I mean, whether it's a coffee shop, a hotel or restaurant, like there's just somebody there that stands out. Right. And they're extraordinary. They uh, really care. They go the extra mile. I keep a list of names of things okay. like that in Hawaii. And it's just this. These are the people right? as I build yeah. that I want to bring on board. I want to talk to them and I want to enable them. And I've found the same thing down here. It's just people are super motivated. They're friendly. They want to learn. Um, on my ride to Tunco last night, I was talking with a driver. He's learning English. I'm learning Spanish. The first thing he said, let's practice. So the whole ride there, it's just broken English, broken Spanish back and forth. But we were able to communicate and we both came out of it better. And I think those type of symbiotic relationships, right? Additive networks, just like Bitcoin, right? Where the yeah. more people you're adding in, it's making it better. It's not competitive. And I think that's a type of mentality and mindset that I want to bring down here. And I think it fits well with the, you know, the culture and the families that are here already. Well, I think that that is a big reason why we have stayed here is those type of relationships. I, as you were saying that, I was thinking of when we first started coming down here, I noticed this this young guy that was running Olas Permanentes, and he just had this unique skill set. Mm -hmm. He was very personable with the people, but he was also getting work done. Sometimes you find one or the other, they're like social, yeah. but uh -huh. they're not getting work done or they're just totally focused on uh -huh. the work, but they're not engaging. Yeah. 
he he had this like way to like you know have this intricate dance with the people of he was still getting things done mm -hmm. doing what was best for the business but making the mm -hmm. you know the customers feel very special and I remember turning to my wife, I said, okay, if we ever do anything in El Salvador, we're, we're going to poach that guy there. Yeah. And uh, that, that's Jorge Valenzuela. He was one of the, the yeah. founders oh, yeah. of, of Hope House and everything we've done here with, yeah. with Bitcoin Beach and um, kind of brought him in with some other work that we were doing with different churches and stuff here. Initially, he had this vision for Hope House. And, and uh -huh. so we kind of behind the scenes, you know, would empower that happening and, and just kind of unleash him and That's beautiful. he's created this, you know, amazing network. Same thing with uh, Chimbera or Roman from, yeah. from Good Life, like seeing just the, the skill sets that he brings mm -hmm. here and um, being able to kind of partner with him in different things. And so I love, yeah. I love that type of thing and seeing that potential in somebody and then yeah. unleashing it. And I love that, that you have that vision because Unfortunately, with the history in El Salvador, that's that type of um, vision for bringing people up is not something that comes naturally. It's, it's always been a very top down society where, you know, a small group of the elite kind of rule everything, have all of the wealth, even much more concentrated than you would find in Europe or the U.S. And so um, I think historically the focus has been keeping people down, make sure they stay in their lane, that they don't get out of, mm -hmm. you know, the role that they're supposed to be doing is serving others. And and it's really held the country back. And so I think bringing people in that kind of unleash mm -hmm. this talent, the hard work ethic that you see here, mm -hmm. um, there's just so much potential and it just needs those connections and somebody to help unleash that. So yeah. I love it. It's beautiful. As Jorge is a Mama Rosa's son? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I went and ate there yesterday for the first time. It was awesome. And I like just going to the different pupuserias and local restaurants and talking with the family. And I have to use my translator app right now. But it's also one of those things that's motivating me to learn more and to see how these families are interconnected and how they're they're already doing yeah. it, right? And I, I think I can come help enable and maybe accelerate that a little bit, but then back away from it. Yeah. Right? It's not not for me to run and continue with, let them run, let them continue with it, pass it down to their families, hire the people that they want, that they've identified, right? And go out uh, from there. But yeah, it's it's awesome being down here. Yeah, no, I, I love I love that vision. Uh, Mama Rosa was, she was the first shop, and you probably know this, but she was the first shop that started accepting Bitcoin here and she's played a, a big role. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's fun just seeing her business grow and prosper and the community at large just growing and prospering. So. I think it's just a mindset change too of um, when I was living in Philadelphia, um, another one of my best friends and I, he was in Harrisburg at the time. He said, hey, come come back. They're having a meeting. Um, it was like a Wednesday night at this, um, one of the bottoms of the hotel. And they're talking about a investment strategy of how you can make money and get back to the community. And we went and we sat in this room and all these people were giving money for a, a set of, CDs that was going to tell them, oh, this is the this is the plan, right? And they're cheering and they're going nuts and they're telling this story. I kept using this guy, the Marine, and telling him that this Marine made all this money. And I looked around and you could see the people that were there and the cars that were in the parking lot. These people were not well off, right? And they all got scammed at yeah. this conference. And I felt like super angry about it. And my friend and I, we went home that night and talked about it. And we said, well, let's just start a charity in our hometown, Harrisburg. And let's do it the exact opposite of that. And so we started that in 2011. It's called Blessed and Appreciative. This is this logo here. Oh, what, I'm sorry, what is it's it? It's called again? Blessed and Appreciative. Okay. And it was uh -huh. kind of a mindset switch of instead of us, you know, being, uh, you know, Americans and wanting the next thing. We got this, we want a bigger house. We want a better car. We want this. Focus more on the blessings that you do have, your health, your family, right? Uh, your happiness and find those and be appreciative for them, right? Instead of looking for the next thing. And so we started doing these events and it just started really small. We rent out a you know community center or a lodge and we'd throw a party and have food. And it was like a gift drive for Christmas. Let's bring as much gifts as we can. And year over year over year, it just kept growing. We do bowling events, we do fundraisers. And the difference about our charity was we did not take any salary, right? So that was the other thing that really off put me about charities, right? Or nonprofits. Um, the healthcare company I worked for on Oahu was a, was a nonprofit, right? And there, it, it, there's no way, shape, or form that they should be allowed to be a nonprofit company with the amount of money and salaries they're paying. So we did it the other way, didn't take any money. We put all the money, gave it right back out. And you don't realize the, 
uh, amount of impact that it can make as you're doing it. But when you look back on it, uh, I left Pennsylvania in 2016 and my friends have continued running it and they've given over a, like a hundred thousand dollars back to the community just from us going out to having fun events with our yeah. friends and family and everybody donating. And it's just such a easy way, but it's a different way of doing it where you're not focusing on yourself. And we've met so many people and we've had expanded our networks and it's, it's just been awesome. So I think that same mentality, I want to bring that down here. And it's also just kind of ingrained down. You can see people are happy. They're so appreciative of everything that they have down here. And it's such a counter to the way that, you know, I was kind of raised in the traditional schooling that we're taught in the States. Yeah. No, I love that. So have you started your residency process yet? That's, or? that's next on my okay. list. Yeah. So I uh, did the incorporation stuff and that should all be finalized. I'm hoping tomorrow. Okay. I'm going to talk to my lawyer tomorrow. And, and that all went pretty yeah. smoothly and easily. It was pretty yeah. straightforward. Yeah, it was very straightforward. Um, yeah. It was an awesome experience. The, um, the only issue that I was not prepared for, they, I uh, just didn't do my uh, homework in time. I didn't load up enough Bitcoin on. Um, so I, that's the other thing. As I come down here, it's the only place I spend Bitcoin. So all the Bitcoin I had, mined, bought, whatever, it's all there. Right? It just doesn't move. I don't sell it. Like I don't play the swings in the market. I'm too dumb for that. I'm just going to lose money. I'm going to lose my hardest asset. But when I come down here, I think it's really important um, to actually use the ecosystem and put your sats out there. I know some people aren't in the position, right, where they can spend their sats and just buy them back, right, because maybe they're not working a traditional job still like I am, but that's the way that I justify it in my yeah. mind, right? I'm gonna go well, if you have to spend money to live. Yeah. You're gonna buy food, you're gonna do yeah. all these things. Why not bless other people by spreading those mm -hmm. sats around? And, mm -hmm. and it also just drives the circular economy. It's yep. not the, these, we're not gonna replace fiat currencies, we don't actually use and circulate yeah. their coins. Exactly. So, and that's an argument I get into a lot of times with, with the HODLer group. Yeah, yeah. And, and trust me, I, I want to yeah. have oh. funds that I'm HODLing. Yeah. I, I understand that. But you also have to live life. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Bitcoin, to... like everything else, you can't take with you. And so if you're going to be living your life and spending money, mm -hmm. it's better to be spending the world's best money. Yeah. And giving that money to other people yeah. and educating them on it. And even like some places, you know, I go around here, I uh, accept Bitcoin. Oh, no. Um, well, what if I pay you a little bit more for the service? Then will you accept it? Oh, oh, then it's like a different conversation, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, or can I pay the check? But uh, propina, I tip you in Bitcoin. Oh, of course. Phone comes out, cheaper yeah. wallet, you can tip in Bitcoin. So I think those things, um, that was that was the one thing when I went to the conference in San Salvador that um, rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, was that the Bitcoiners that were there, the majority of them were not using Bitcoin to pay for things, right? They were all cash, credit card, yep. every single thing, right? I'd get, watch the guy get off stage, give this awesome talk and go to the bar and use his credit card yep. or pull out cash. And it just was like, wow, this is- Which was crazy because the hotel had lightning dude, payments everything. enabled by yeah. Ibex had set them all dude. up. It worked dude. faster than credit cards. It was dude. super easy it to was, use. It was awesome yeah. experience everything yeah. down there i was able to pay for in bitcoin and then they tracked the transactions right and i think the light bulb moment for me was I bought like three hats two t-shirts and a program and it was the biggest lightning transaction at the whole conference like i'm nobody like like these people there they got bags yeah. right yeah and these guys just weren't willing to put it out there in the ecosystem or support it that way yeah and it was kind of eye-opening to me and i think i can kind of champion that as well of like hey guys there's a way to spend you definitely want to save your bitcoin right it's going to be worth way more in a year in two years in five years in ten years right but you also need to be able to promote the network and the utility of the network right because there's so many layers in my mind that can be built on top of this there's so many real world problems that bitcoin fixes but if you just keep it in your hardware wallet you know on ice all the time yeah right? just, nobody else is going to find out about it right yeah, I, I tweeted, uh, it was a few weeks ago, that uh, that it was the those who only hodl are are the ones that are, you know, actively holding back circular Bitcoin economies from being developed because mm -hmm. they have the resource, mm -hmm. but they're choosing to use fiat instead. Yeah. And so if, are, 
how can you claim to be, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to be on a Bitcoin standard if you're not even willing to, able to spend it? And I got all kinds of hate back about, you know, why mm -hmm. would you spend the hardest money? You should spend the worst money first. I'm like, why are you holding dollars then? You have this opportunity. It's very easy to go back and forth. Yeah. So why not buy Bitcoin and then spend it? And I understand for some people there's tax headaches, there's, yeah. there's other issues. But if we really believe that Bitcoin mm -hmm. is going to change the world, it's going to level the playing field and we're not willing to do a little extra work to mm -hmm. make it happen. I yeah. mean, how much do we really believe it? Oh, yeah, I agree. And it's also now like um, having my own business for a couple of years. And the first year, I just didn't know what I was doing. Right? I didn't have a CPA. I didn't have a lawyer. I was late filing taxes, had to pay a lot of penalties and things like that. But then after I got a little bit more organized this past year, my wife really helped me out with accounting, found a better CPA, talked to lawyers. And even at the conference with El Salvador now having it as a reserve currency, file taxes. It's now El Salvador in Bitcoin or some Bitcoin. Yeah. I come down here and I spend the reserve currency of El Salvador in El Salvador. So how are you going to tax me for that? Right. I'm spending the actual currency of the country that's down here. And the other part that's interesting to me too, being in Hawaii, super restrictive on anything Bitcoin, right? They kick Coinbase out. Um, they don't have They it. kick Coinbase out. Oh yeah. This oh, was really? like 2017. Okay. Gone. I didn't realize that. Yep. So that we're not allowed to use Coinbase in Hawaii, not allowed to use Binance, um, not allowed to use any of the big sites, right? The river has been awesome. Like Alex, I met him at the conference, you know, fully yeah, back to full guy. reserve. Yeah. Like they're, they're great. I do some mining with them as well. Their mining platform is awesome. Blockstream data centers up and running. Uh, do some mining with Compass as well. I would okay. not recommend that to anyone. Do not, <laughs> do not put your money in there. Um, but it's it's kind of just interesting to see how restrictive they are in Hawaii with it. And then just in the past months, they have two bills going through the legislature, um, SB 352 and 525. And they talk about um, digital e-cash and the bills are 70 pages long, super convoluted, hard to understand, hard to read through them. But effectively, what they're doing is laying the framework for a central bank digital currency and a cashless society. And my my simple minded prediction is Hawaii is going to be one of the first states, you know, where they over the weekend ATMs don't work. And all of a sudden on a Monday, now you have a, you know, CBDC yeah. digital bank account. Come turn your cash in. We'll turn it into a token for you. And I don't think people realize kind of what's going on. And then that's their same. Probably bill. most people will go along with it. They'll think, oh, this is more convenient. Oh, yeah. yeah, perfect. Because they claim that it's doing some of the things that Bitcoin does, right? Gets rid of transaction fees, fixes some of the broken, you know, Fed to Swift to ACH yeah. to Star to Cirrus, you know, to Max, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, all these networks that don't talk together. And it does solve that, but it solves it with the same bad actors and the same centralized mechanisms that are already in place. And that's not talked about, right? Yeah. And I think that's another big reason. Once I saw that bill and read through it and they start talking about e-cash and what is e-cash and what is not e-cash and they're going to reserve the right to say which is which isn't. That was another light bulb moment for me of, yeah, I, I need to look other places um, if I'm going to continue working in the Bitcoin ecosystem, working on the layer two lightning payment network, working on additional layers, continue mining, continue doing all the things I enjoy doing now yeah. with Bitcoin. I want to go somewhere where it's supported and it's incentivized and it's not um, a lot of this additional red tape and handcuffs and hoops that I have to jump to. And it's also sad, in my opinion, from um, like the local Hawaiian perspective, as I talked to, because they have so much resources out there for whether it's geothermal energy, clean energy, that if they would make that switch and flip uh, sort of like El Salvador did, it would really enable them and empower them um, to be able to kind of pull themselves up out of the situation that they're in now. Yeah. No, I, I think people underestimate how important it is to, to be, and, and not that we put our hope in government, but it makes a big difference if you're in a jurisdiction where the government actually is supporting rather than trying to stand in the way. Mm -hmm. And I think those lines are going to become clearer and clearer mm -hmm. the further we go along as different countries start adopting CBDCs and and becoming more antagonistic towards Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, we were there was like a small conference with the the, the Praia Bitcoin uh, group that's down in Brazil and Jericho Cara and and we were 
I was amazed at the digital cash system that Brazil has rolled out because I hadn't heard anything about that, but they have basically already laid the groundwork for this by providing these machines. I mean, you'd be at a little hole in the wall place that you'd think there's no way they're accepting digital payments and they're connected to the system because mm -hmm. it's free. The government, you know, is, is absorbing the fees and it's, they don't have to pay credit card fees. They're giving them the, the you know, the post machines to use. Mm -hmm. And you saw how quickly people are willing to give up their privacy and their rights mm -hmm. for those type of conveniences. And so mm -hmm. I think we really have to be on guard and we're going to see that it's going to make mm -hmm. a big difference if you're in a place like El Salvador that is supporting and driving Bitcoin adoption or these other countries that are trying to stand against it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So what do you tell people that are kind of like, ah, oh, you're crazy for wanting to move down to El Salvador? What is... Nah, they already... Um, nobody understood when I moved from Philadelphia to Hawaii. Right? I went to all my friends and all my family. Like, oh, it's great. You have an awesome job. Did you get a big promotion? It's expensive in Hawaii. It's like, no, I actually took like two or three demotions and I moved there and I took a salary that was a fraction of what I was getting paid. And it was rough for like the first two years for us to normalize. We burnt through all of our savings. Yeah. It was um, like my wife and I had um, arguments a lot. Like, and it took us a while to just kind of get through that and pull out of it and everything. But once we did, we're like, wow, we, we made the right choice. And it was, and it wasn't financially incentivized. It wasn't like the traditional way of thinking, you know, it was giving up the material things, you know, that we had in Philadelphia, I had a house, the car I wanted, the motorcycle I wanted. I just kept buying junk, right? Because yeah. I didn't know what else to do with it. And it was like a status symbol thing. You're keeping up with the Joneses. That was refreshing when I came to Hawaii and there, there wasn't much of that, right? There's in Honolulu a little bit, big businesses, lots of rich people. When you get to the big island, it's like nine out of 10 cars is a Toyota Tacoma. And it's it's nice to see, right? Yeah. And they, they, people keep them forever. They, they run with it. Doesn't matter. Like I, I dress like a bum. I, I, I look homeless a lot of the time. And then I talk and have these deep conversations with people. I, they look at me. I actually just shaved my beard. It was like, I know you talked to Francesco the other day. Yeah, yeah. It was similar. It was just like, like this massive beard. Okay. And But I just don't, it was very keeping up appearances before. And yeah. I just don't really care about that anymore. I think more I just want to be honest. It's really hard um, when you tell lies to keep track of your lies and to keep things straight and to be fake and all of this stuff. And it, it's been very freeing. Um, I have another funny story about that. I was working uh, this insurance company in Hawaii, and it was a big break point for me when I broke off and started my own um, my own independent consulting. They um, they claimed a lot of hardship because of COVID, right? But you could see I was at a director level leadership team, and you could kind of see that it wasn't it was bullshit, right? Yeah, they're making tons and tons of money, right? They had a big antitrust lawsuit for a whole across Blue Shield, across all the states, right? So everyone has to pay their share. And um, they hid that. And they essentially, all of my employees, all of the other employees of the company said, sorry, it's a bad year because of COVID. We can only give you a 1.5% merit increase merit increase right not cost of living not anything but meanwhile cost of living went up maybe six seven eight nine percent that year so everybody lost money me being on a management team I went to the meeting i'm like well that sucks it is what it is oh hey management team we're gonna pay out your bonus at 25 percent additional on top of what you're supposed to get right and it was like wow that's super greedy this is a nonprofit. Right. And people were doubling their salaries. People were getting paid these bonuses and the same thing. They, they started to outsource jobs. And these people were my friends. They came to my wedding. Um, I had just gotten promoted a few times. So now I was their boss. Yeah. And the company line was, oh, no, you can't talk about this. You can't tell anybody about this. But Hawaii is a great place because everybody knows everybody. <laughs> so our vendors. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a it's. It's yeah. a small town. Oh, you know, yeah. So word got yeah, out quick, yeah. Mike. It was quick, right? And so my guys are calling me. What's going on? What's up with this contract for this big, you know, hundred million dollar outsourcing effort over ten years? Why can't can we bid on this, right? The other vendors that I yeah. know. Why why aren't we included in this? And then they started coming to my team, and I went to my boss. This guy, Peter, is awesome still to this day. And I told him, I was like, I just have a problem with this. Like, I don't want to lie to my friends. And I, I came out of a meeting and I talked to my wife. I was like, that's the first time I've told a, like a, a lie in a couple of years. And I felt super terrible about it. And I went to my boss and was like, yeah, this just isn't for me anymore. And he, to his um, you know, merit, it was 
not in his best interest to let me go because I was helping and doing a lot of stuff. He's like, dude, just leave. I was like, well, how much do you want me to stay for a month or two? He's like, you shouldn't stay any longer. He said, you should put in your notice and go home. Just leave. <laughs> like, don't even wait for the boss, like the big boss to come down and talk to you. You know, he's going to come down and talk to you. So I took his advice, cut ties. I called all of my friends that night. Said, hey guys, sorry for lying to you. My mistake. Um, and then just two weeks ago, I went and hung out with all these people again, right? We golf out and yeah. go to dinner. We do all this stuff. But had I chose to tow the company line, tell the lies, right? I probably would have burned a lot of those friendships. And I think to me, that's what's really important, right? Not trying to advance myself, advance my career. Let's build a network of like-minded, strong people that are going to be there for you when the chips are down, right? The company could care less about me, right? Get yeah. sick, I die. They're not going to be there for me. Those guys, I'll call them up. They're on a flight, right? They're here. They'll come see me. They'll help me out. And I think that was a big, big change in like a turning point for me personally and for my wife. And it was like the same, like all we went down this path and all of a sudden things just started aligning and dropping into place for us. And it's, yeah, it's been great. So I'll recommend that. that to you. you think any of those people will follow you guys here at El Salvador? Or is that like just too crazy for, for most people? to? Um, I think there will be some, but I did the same thing. So we came to the conference last year. I was like, I'm going to book a big space um, to stay. I want some of you guys to come and I don't want you to have an excuse. You know, get on a plane, come yeah. down. Hotel's taken care of. Everybody turned me down. I came down this trip. Same thing. Who wants to come? Everybody. Because every time I come down, it's, oh, it's great. I can't wait. I want to come. Same thing with Hawaii. How yeah. much people have visited us in Hawaii in eight years? Maybe 10 people. Right? All these people with big plans. They're going to do this. Timing's never right. So I would say probably not. Right? There'll be a few. And I think that they're um, a little bit more conservative than me. And they also have, you know, maybe they have kids, maybe they have more responsibility than me yeah. too. So it's easy for me to be able to make that decision with my wife to come down here. But that's another, I got lots of stories for you, Mike. 2013, I got diagnosed with cancer, right? I'm sitting, I go to the doctor's office. I had a lump on a testicle. They were like, oh, it's probably hydrocele. So they sent me for an ultrasound. And I didn't think anything of it. I went on about my, I was riding a motorcycle a lot. I thought I maybe just like, smashed it yeah. and did something. And I didn't uh, didn't think anything of it. So like months later, I'm checking through my junk mail. I find this piece of mail and I open it. It's like, Mr. McPherson, we've been trying to contact you for weeks. Um, you have cancer, you have testicular cancer. You need to come in immediately. And so I remember sitting in front, I was working at a, a pharmaceutical company in Philadelphia at the time. And I read it in my car. I'm like, oh my God, like my heart just sank. Yeah. And I was like, man, that's depressing. That's, um, that sucks. <laughs> but it was one of those things that going through that process, it changed my perspective on everything, right? It was, life is very, very fragile. Um, the people that rally around you in those times is very important and uh the people that don't they they identify themselves quickly right yeah. who's your real friends who's not and i think going through that i met i met my wife in that time she was super supportive with me i had dated a, a another girl since high school and for like 10 years she was living with me so her family's awesome i was like very it was like very hard to like break away from that but it was one of those same things where it just kind of identified throughout the process and i think without that happening to me i would not have met my wife and I wouldn't have had, I got less balls now, but I wouldn't have had the balls <laughs> to move to Hawaii, right? Yeah, no, it is a lot of those times, the the hard things that we go through that, that shape and mold mm -hmm. us and set us up for yeah. a future that's better than what we had even you know, thought yeah. we might have. And I think it's kind of the, the path that was laid out for me of being able to not have to focus and worry and and, um, devote my time and energy and money to my kids, right? Um, we got a nephew, Cameron, it's awesome, love him. And then I have a niece now, B, and they're, they're gonna be spoiled. We already got Bitcoin, they're, they're, they're good, right? They're, they're away, they got their own wallets, they're good to go. But the same thing when I come down here, now I can be free to uh, help others, yeah. right? Identify that, and that same thing with our charity in Pennsylvania, it was just underserved, underprivileged youth. And that was what we targeted. And we gave the money directly to them. We didn't, didn't donate it to United Way or Red Cross or somebody yeah. that's going to take their margins. Like, here's the money that comes in, push it out, right? And it was awesome. It was just very satisfying. And it was, um, you could see the impact that it made directly to these people. Well, I am uh, excited that you're going to be here. I definitely have to plan on, on how we can help 
you know, get these people with the certificates that mm -hmm. they need and start driving um, the, the local workforce to these better jobs. So I'm, um, that's been one of my goals from the beginning, but I don't work in the space like yeah. you do. So I don't, I'm like, I know these jobs are out there. I don't know how, yeah. how to direct you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having people like yourself that can come down, that can serve as mentors, mm -hmm. that can serve as guides. I think once we get this ball rolling, you know, that the generation that comes after this generation will have the paths laid out for them and mm -hmm. they'll just have a totally different options and better future for. So I'm, I'm excited to see all the unique people that are being drawn to El mm -hmm. Salvador and how it's really going to transform things. So yeah. I, mean, okay. I don't know if there's any other things you want people to know about. Um, obviously, your your company, um, other is there any other stuff you want to? No, I don't have anything to show. Okay. I'm good. It's still Bitcoin. Um, yeah. Happy to have my company down here. And same thing. I'd like to find motivated local. Wait, can people operators. find you on Twitter or where? Oh yeah, where Twitter. You... It's just Matt McPherson. Okay. It's just my name, uh, Matt McPherson. All one word. Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever wherever okay. they want to find me, reach out. Um, company is Uila. Uh, uh -huh. My email is Matt at Uila U I L A dot I O. Please and, reach out. And are you doing both lightning and security stuff or mm -hmm. is it all the same company or is it yeah. two separate companies? Yeah, so it's it... all rolled in under one company okay. now. Um, I call I kind of call it as backed by Bitcoin. So I have miners that are associated with it that are just mining away okay. and that just sits there as our reserve. And then we're actually going out yeah, and doing um, independent consulting work. I have maybe three or four different clients now that have different projects that just come and go. And uh, yeah, like I said, when I was here this week, I just got offered another kind of opportunity with that as well. And I think that one is a, a bigger partner that has a lot of different connections um, across the United States and even other countries. And like, those are the type of relationships that I think will really enable um, the students down here that want to learn and let's do some certificates and let's pick a specialization that they want to go that that, type of entity that has a lot of plugs yeah. in will be able to like, okay, let's, let's figure out how we can service this and how we can structure these things um, to make it an easy on ramp instead of right, the hard process of sending your, your resume out there and never yeah. getting a call back, anything like that. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you uh, changing your flight and uh, you know, I'm glad I was able to give you an excuse to spend a little more time here. Yeah. You got to be careful though, because people come down here for a week and you know, a year later they're, uh, they still can't find uh, you know, themselves to the airport. So yeah. um, you know, your wife may have to join you here. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> what she was. She said that to our friends this weekend. She's like, I don't know if Matt will come back. <laughs> Yeah, so she she may have to join me here, but no, I think I'll go back and uh, help. Yeah, you got to get yeah. everything packed up and ready <laughs> to, to make the big move. Yeah, so. well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. All right. Thank you.